Bernadine Lennon, a member of the Green Drear Historical Society Board of Directors. We are located in South Sterling, Wayne County, in the northeastern part of Pennsylvania, right in the heart of the Pocono Mountains. For the past 200 years, the communities of Green Township, Pike County, and Drear Township, Wayne County, have been linked through a common history, through marriages, and organizations. When the German settlers came to the Wallenpaupack Valley in the early 1800s, they purchased land on either side of the Wallenpaupack Creek. To their west was what would become Drear Township, and to their east was Green Township. And their properties spanned the fertile uh, Wallenpaupack Valley and up the hillsides on either side where there was virgin forest. And since that time, residents of the two townships have worked together, um, married, and organized for the betterment of their community. For example, they formed the Green Drear Fire Association in the mid 1950s. In the early 1900s, they formed the Green Drear High School and that led to the Green Drear Sterling Fair, which continues to this day. And most recently, the Green Drear Historical Society. Now today I will um, give a history on Ledgedale and what occurred there um, about 150 years ago. The village of Ledgedale is located at the southern end of Lake Wall and Paw Pack. The lake is a 13 mile uh, body of water containing 5,700 acres, which was created in 1926 for hydroelectric power purposes. Prior to the lake, the Wall and Paw Pack River flowed in this valley with farms on either side. During the process of uh, creating the lake, Buildings were removed and the lumber repurposed, including many of the buildings in Ledgedale. There is little evidence of the village of Ledgedale, which was a thriving tannery town during the mid to late 1800s. It was truly the economic engine for the area and was one of the largest tanneries in Wayne and Pike counties. The Ledgedale tannery was built when the natural resources of Northeast Pennsylvania and their potential were being discovered and exploited as resources in other parts of the country were being depleted. It was an ideal location for a tannery because it was close to bark supplies and there was ample water. These were two important resources required by all tanneries. There was also a tannery at the north end of the lake near Hawley called the Cromwell Tannery, but it um, processed about 50% of the um, hides that the Ledgedale tannery processed. Now tanning is the process of making leather from animal hides and was an important industry in New York and Pennsylvania in the 19th century. It became one of six big widespread industries in Pennsylvania, the others being lumbering, coal mining, iron making, farming, and railroading. Tanneries were located in every county of the state. To show you how important the tanning business was at the time, we need only to talk about Jay Gould. Gould was born in the Catskills where the primary industry was tanning. Through self-study, he learned to be a surveyor. In 1856, Gould met Zadok Pratt, one of New York's wealthiest and most respected citizens. Pratt owned the largest tannery in the world at the time and founded the town of Prattsville, New York to accommodate his workers. In 1843, Pratt established the Prattsville Bank, which printed its own bills that were kept on par with the US dollar. Pratt was impressed with Jay Gould's abilities and ambition. And in 1856, they established a partnership 
um, and agreed to build a tannery in the virgin forests of Northeast Pennsylvania between the Lehigh and Delaware rivers. The abundant supply of hemlock bark was ideal for tanning. Pratt pledged up to $120,000 in capital. Gould, who knew absolutely nothing about the tanning process and industry in general, assumed charge of the operation. In September, Gould selected the site of the tannery, a location he described as 15 miles from any place, but actually it was midway between Scranton in Lackawanna County and Stroudsburg in Monroe County. The workmen christened the remote settlement Gouldsboro. Jay Gould left his mark in northeastern Pennsylvania with the founding of Gouldsboro, located about 15 miles southwest of Ledgedale. Burton Morris owned a number of tanneries in the Catskills also. In the mid 1840s, the hemlock forests of New England and New York were being depleted of their trees because of timber harvesting for tanneries. In the Catskill region alone, as many as 64 tanneries harvested 70 million hemlock trees in the 19th century. Tannin could also be obtained from hardwood trees. However, hemlock's tannic acid produced a deep reddish brown color in the leather, which many consumers preferred to the lighter color produced by hardwoods. When the supply of hemlock trees diminished, Morris moved his operation south to northeastern Pennsylvania, where there were millions of acres of virgin, virgin forest. He began purchasing large tracts of land in Wayne and Pike counties for his tannery in 1849. He initially went into partnership with two other men to build the Ledgedale Tannery, but later became sole owner. By 1850, the tannery was operational. Eventually, Morris would own over 10,000 acres of land in Wayne and Pike counties for the purpose of harvesting the hemlock. Now, this image is a scene of Newfoundland in Dreher Township taken in the late 1800s or early 1900s. And you can see how the hillside by then has been denuded of trees as a result of excessive timber harvesting, much of that for the Ledgedale tannery. Burton Morris never lived in Ledgedale, but remained in the Catskills overseeing his other tanneries. He also had a cotton mill, grist mill, creamery, and farms. He probably visited this area in the early years of the tannery, but he delegated the operation of the Ledgedale Tannery to his son, Leonidas Morris, who in 1860, at the age of 22, began managing the tannery's operations. He and his family lived above the tannery. Originally called Tannery Town, the name was changed to Ledgedale because of the rock ledges along the Wallen Pawpack River. Newly arrived Irish and later German immigrants were employed at the tannery and lived nearby along the Wallenpawpack River. This map was produced in 1872 and shows the various buildings belonging to Morris. The Red Star is the approximate location of the current Ledgedale Bridge. The photo in the lower right was taken in the 1870s from the Pike County side of the Wallenpawpack River. The tannery buildings in this photo are situated on the Wayne County side of the river, just north of the bridge. You can see how cleared of trees the hillside is behind the tannery. And please note the clump of trees just to the center of the hillside. We will come back to, to their significance in the next slide. The tannery's general store is noted on this slide and was located behind the clump of trees I noted in the earlier side. The green star to the left notes the location of the dam on the river just south of the tannery. Water was diverted from the dam into a narrow channel called a mill race, known, noted by the yellow star. Compared with the broader waters of the river, the water in the mill race moved faster and powered water wheels, which operated Morris's grist mill and sawmill. 
The Morris Holdings included hundreds of acres of land on which oats, rye, and potatoes were grown, and orchards were full of apple trees. In 1870, the Morris Grist Mill produced 14,000 bushels of ground grain. The Morris Orchards yielded 150 bushels of apples. The so Morris Sawmill employed four men and milled 1.5 million board feet of lumber in 1870. The hills surrounding Ledgedale were filled with old growth forest. The soils and climate were favorable to growing large tracts of hemlock trees, many of which grew to more than 160 feet tall and six feet in diameter. This vast natural resource was the prime component in the leather tanning industry. Animal hides soaked in hemlock tannin produced leather that was resistant to water and decay. This image is of an old growth forest in Clarion County, Pennsylvania and exists today. It is what the forests of Northeastern Pennsylvania looked like 170 years ago, before trees were harvested for the tanning industry. Hemlock bark was harvested in the spring and summer in one of two ways. Some lumbermen girded the trees in the spring when the bark was loose and returned later to harvest the loosened bark on the stump an act that left gleaming barkless trees beneath the dark hemlock canopy. The more common method was to cut down the tree and then peel the bark off as far as practical, cutting it into four foot strips. The tree's trunk was sometimes sawn into boards, but since hemlock is inferior to white pine for building purposes, hemlock wood was often left to rot in the forest. The bark was the only desired product. It's estimated that two men could fell trees and peel two to three cords of hemlock bark per day. The longer the bark remained in the woods, the greater was the loss of tannin. Rain would gradually wash out the tannin, therefore bark was transported as quickly as possible and stored under sheds if not processed immediately. This image shows the different stages of harvesting hemlock bark from peeling it to stacking it to dry to pulling it out on sleds with oxen. Ledgedale tannery alone processed up to 30,000 animal hides yearly. Wayne County had 19 tanneries and Monroe County had 26 in the mid 1800s. So where did the hides come from to supply all of these tanneries? There was an insufficient supply of cow hides at the local, regional, or even state levels. Tanneries throughout the Northeast received their hides from South America. Buenos Aires alone exported 2 million hides per year to North America and Europe. Hides preserved in salt were shipped from South America to New York City. From there, they were shipped 100 miles up the Hudson River to round out New York loaded on canal boats from Honesdale, which had just been emptied of coal they had carried from the Lackawanna Valley. It was a 108 mile trip from Honesdale to Roundout and the boats passed through 108 locks. Returning to Honesdale, the boats stopped in Hawley where hides were un unloaded and brought to the Ledgedale Tannery by steamboat. Finished leather followed the reverse route to city markets. In 1871 alone, 26,000 tons of hides and leather and 865 tons of tanner's bark were transported on the Delaware and Hudson Canal. Between the 1860s and 1890s, the United States leather industry assumed control over untanned hides from South America and became a major exporter of tanned hides, particularly to Britain. By 1895, the United States was the most important source of foreign tanned leather for Great Britain. The bark was heavy and bulky and had to be hand loaded onto wagons or sleds. The Morris Tannery owned 47 horses, mules, and oxen to bring in the bark to the tannery and logs to its sawmill. The tannery also contracted this work with area farmers 
to use their teams of horses and oxen for the work. The bark was dried and taken to bark sheds for storage until needed. It was then taken to the tannery's bark mill where the bark would be shredded or broken into small pieces, almost to a powder consistency. It was then heated with steam in order for the tannin from the bark to be released and the tannin solution stored until needed to tan hides. The ground or shredded bark was taken then to leach tanks containing hot water, which extracted the tannin from the bark to make tannic acid. Two and a half cords of bark would make sufficient tannin to tan 100 hides. Life in the tannery was tough. The work was hard manual label, labor for which the workers received 85 cents a day or the equivalent of $28 in today's money. Living next to a tannery meant the constant stench of curing leather and stagnant pools of waste material. Streams became heavily polluted as tannin, lime solutions, flesh and hair were discharged directly into them. Hillsides were stripped of hemlock. There was much erosion of the hillsides during heavy rain. On the other hand, the tanneries provided a livelihood often for immigrants. Up to 70 men worked at the Ledgedale Tannery, many of whom owned farms and worked in the tanneries part-time or seasonally. They worked 12-hour days with only Sundays off. Besides the men, directly employed at the tannery, the industry indirectly employed many others, including the bark peelers who sold their bark by the cord or contracted their labor by the day. The bark peelers would set up camps in the forest during the spring and summer and strip trees from dawn to dusk. Thomas Lennon, the son of an Irish immigrant family, worked in the tannery. He was bitten by a horse and required injections of serum in his abdomen for treatment. The doctor could not force the needle through Tom's skin because the skin around his abdomen and arms had become tanned and hardened from the treated hides he had carried for many years at the tannery. The tanning process took up to nine months. During six of those months, the hides were soaked in tannin. The remaining months were used to prepare the hides for the tanning process by cleaning them, removing hair and fat, and drying them. Tanneries were dangerous places to work. The Ledgedale tannery burned twice. Men sometimes fell into the large chemical vats. Toxins released by the tannery polluted the river. Solid rape wastes contained toxins leaching into soil and water. The air was putrid smelling. To remove salt, dirt, and blood from the hides, the hardened hides were washed and soaked in vats of water, shown in the center. After the preliminary washing, the hides were then placed hair down in a vat, which contained a lime solution and which would remove hair and the top layers of skin. Workers to the left of the photo, known as fleshers, removed the hides from the lime water and used a sharp knife to scrape the remaining oils, flesh, and hair from the hide. Incidentally, the grease and hair left over from the fleshing process was often sold to masons for use in making mortar. The hides were then ready for the tanning operation, which required the most space in the tannery. Hundreds of hides were placed in pits in the ground filled, filling the building. Each vat held the tannin solution and hides would remain in the vats for weeks, if not months. The final finishing for the hides required them being washed to remove the tannin solution and then passed through rollers to squeeze out excess liquids and then dried. The Ledgedale Tannery ranked second out of the 19 tan tanneries in Wayne County. It processed up to 30,000 cattle hides yearly, and the leather it produced was valued at $44 million in today's money. 
At one time, Wayne County had the largest tanneries in the world. The tanneries um, were at their, operated at their peak during the Civil War when the need for uh, tanned leather to make boots and shoes and saddles and harnesses for the Union troops. After that, uh, there was a gradual decline in the um, tannery operations and uh, in some they closed. The tannery operated until the late 1890s. What buildings remained were dismantled during the construction of Lake Wallenpawpack in the mid 1920s and sold to local residents. This image shows the historic sites that remain from when the Ledgedale Tannery was in operation. Going left to right is the Ledgedale Cemetery located in Indian Rocks Development where many of the German immigrants who worked at the tannery are buried. And from there in the middle is a private residence that was built at the time of the tannery operations. The Leonidas Morris family home is to the right of that. The red star to the right is the approximate location of the one room school which served the workers' children. It also uh, served as a meeting house on Sunday for worship services. When the lake is level is low, its foundations can be seen as indicated in the upper right photo. This image uh, shows where the dam that diverted water to the mill race was located upstream from the tannery and the current Ledgedale Bridge. When the lake level is low, you can see the remains of the dam by the partial stone walls that remain. The red line approximates the location of the mill race. The white area to the left of the red line has been silted in. The Ledgedale Grist Mill was built along the race. Some of the rocks forming the wall of the mill race are seen when the lake level is low, as shown in the lower photo. Over the past 100 years, the mill race has been silted in by mud and dirt from erosion and flooding. Only when the lake level is low is the mill race visible. To the south of the mill race and bridge was the location of the tannery buildings. In 2017, the Historical Society published Mills on the Wall and Paw Pack, written by member Diane Smith. Diane researched the various mills, grist mills, stick factories, and lumber mills on the east and west and south branches of the Wall and Paw Pack. The history of the Ledgedale Tannery and its associated mills is included in this book, and it, the book includes many original images from the area. Copies of the book are available from the Historical Society, and you can get more information on our website. The website also lists um, all, of, all of our publications, and uh, it has additional stories from the local area, veterans stories, and uh, we also have additional videos on our YouTube channel including Green Drear in the Great War and the Flood of 1955. Thank you for joining me today and I uh, hope to see you again in the near future for another story about the Green Drear community.